All right, folks, today we're uh, looking at Chapter 7 and the topics in that chapter. I'm not really going to spend a lot of time on this slideshow, but I do want to make sure that we hit certain key topics. Of course, you always want to read the chapter because you will be quizzed and tested on it. Uh, we will have a quiz coming up kind of like between now and the end of the semester, probably in the early part of March, I'm thinking, or mid-March is probably about when it will happen. And then, of course, we'll have a final exam. Um, so I'll give you fair warning on those when they come up, but uh, the way to do well on those is really just to read through the chapters. If you're not really big on reading, grab the PowerPoints and just, you know, rifle through the PowerPoints because they really kind of hit the highlights. Um, the book really isn't a bad read, um, and the assignments that I give you guys out of it are really kind of focused on getting guys supposed to kind of think about things um, that are happening and to kind of open your, your mind to a few possibilities. But uh, our topic today, e-commerce and e-business, but they have some definitions here. And they, they seem to kind of overlap a little bit, right? Because they're kind of the same thing. Um, but notice that e-business is a broader concept. So when I asked that question about like what was the first thing sold online, it was kind of like a little mystery in the question because we really didn't have a definition that we're really basing it on. So like, what does that mean to buy something online? You, you might have a different idea than uh, what you're thinking. But really, the question was more in the form of what is e-business because you can use electronics. I mean, heck, you can, you can make sales with a, with a phone, right? So would that fit with e-business? I think it kind of does. Yeah. Electronic commerce? More likely when I'm thinking e-commerce, I'm thinking actually selling on the internet. Like you use like PayPal or a uh, credit card or your checking account or whatever to transfer the funds. Have you guys all purchased something online at one point in your life? Yeah. Right? Probably use the credit card, yeah. I'm thinking. All right. Um, but the other way is to pay. Has anybody ever used PayPal? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. And, and, and you're going to get lots of strong opinions both ways on it, but what's PayPal? Uh, it's a it's kind of like a tax, a smaller way of the credit card and then Yeah, that's the irony of it. You can, you can pay with PayPal, and that means you're actually paying with your credit card? Yeah. Yeah. Or your bank account? or your debit card, or a bunch of other mechanisms. It really kind of allows you to aggregate your payment mechanisms, kind of in the same way Amazon does. So like, if you are on Amazon, it's like I have like my debit card, my credit card, blah, 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 blah. There are all these different ways to pay right within Amazon. You know, because sometimes you have more money in one account than the other, that kind of thing. Or I prefer that my wife pays for it because she's buying it, you know, that kind of thing. Right. So PayPal is just a, a, it's a kind of a payment mechanism that aggregates payment mechanisms. But most people think that when you purchase stuff online, the only way to do it is with a credit card. Wrong. You can also pay directly with a check, right? So you can pay directly from a bank account. I would consider that maybe a little more risky if you don't trust the seller, though, right. right? But the other thing that you can do, a lot of people aren't aware of this, is when you actually plop down plastic, if you have like a major credit card, let's say like you got Citibank or Bank of America or Chase or something like that, a lot of those companies, if you're making a big purchase, you can contact them and say, hey, I'm going to buy this like $2,000 laptop online. Can you give me a temporary credit card number? So they will give you a temporary number if you're paranoid about doing it so that whoever the buyer or the seller is doesn't get your actual credit card number. Now, I don't know how much fraud is happening these days that way, but it used to not be that hard for people to steal your credit card number. And it still isn't, right? You guys are aware, aware of the scam that you can go to some ATMs or even some point of sale systems and people put skimmers on them where they're reading your card right when the store is reading your card and then all of a sudden they have all your data on the card. It's kind of a scary, scary thing. All right, let's move on to the next uh, slide. You know, what's fascinating about doing stuff online is there's different levels of it, right? So. I can put an ad on Craigslist to like sell something, meet up with them, you know, exchange cash or whatever, and be done, right? But when we think of online sales, we really do think of that like shopping cart, 
credit card, you know, pay for shipping or free shipping, hopefully, uh, type of approach. And, and when they say degree of digitization, they're really kind of referring to how steeped in the electronic commerce component, like how they're moving money around and how you're actually choosing to buy the product. Have you guys, have any of you guys walked into McDonald's recently? You know the one up on Douglas just put this system in. You're, you'd walk up and you go, hi, I'd like a cheeseburger with fries, you know, with no onions or whatever. But now they got a little kiosk you can walk up to. You know, I tried it. Yeah, dude. Yeah, right? It's all right. It's kind of better than talking to somebody who probably didn't understand what you said. Can't you, like, build it, too? Yeah. Yeah, you can, yeah, you can, do, you can do it all. Like, like, I want, like, this, and I want that on it. And you can, yeah, you can totally customize it. it might, that might be the easier part. Or how many, how many of you have ever gone to, um, or maybe even your parents, I'm thinking, go to Starbucks and they have the Starbucks mobile app, right? Yep. So order on your phone, you walk in, your coffee's ready, yep. <laughs> you just go. Mm -hmm. yep. So that, that's a kind of a thing. There's lots of businesses that, that kind of do the, the brick and mortar thing, right? So that's like a tr traditional business, and McDonald's is one of those. <laughs> But they're putting these little kiosks in, so we're seeing like that, that aspect of it coming into the mix. Why is that good for McDonald's? Uh, it's, uh, uh, it uh, builds more traffic because, like, say, for instance, you can have three cashiers at the cash register, but then you have four of those other kiosks. So at the same time, you're actually working, uh, you're actually tending to seven customers at the same right. time. Right, and then if you know their system pretty well, you know, and I'm, I think they gear it towards young people, right? It's like a young person's going to walk up and take a number one fries, coke, do, 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 put slide the card, good. I'm good to go, and these people are still waiting in line, yeah. right? And you get ahead of the queue. I think I think it's kind of, and the other thing for McDonald's is now they're not paying somebody whatever they're paying them, a pittance, yeah. to sit there and take your order. Now they have that person, you know, making the food or bringing the food out to you or maybe keeping the restaurant cleaner. <laughs> or whatever the case may be, I'm not, I'm not slamming them as a business, I'm just saying that's kind of an interesting uh, philosophy. But that click and mortar thing that we were talking about earlier, that's a huge one too. A lot of businesses now are doing the hybrid thing. Yeah. yeah. That, that's the one that really impresses me the most because I guess around Racine and in suburban areas, I, I don't really see like Peapod trucks or people delivering groceries. But where I live, I, you know, we live in a very dense urban environment, lots of college kids, lots of older people, people with money, people with no money, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a huge mix. The amount of stuff that gets delivered by like Amazon, the post office, UPS, FedEx, like people, like, uh, I see like groceries being delivered. There's some college kids that live next door to us for a while. They kept giving the Jimmy John's the wrong address and they'd like be knocking on my door at like three o'clock in the morning, I kid you not. <laughs> like, What's that? Three o'clock in the morning. Who's knocking on the door? Oh, Jimmy John's. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't order Jimmy John's. This is 24 or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my address. Oh no, that's the guy next door. So I finally caught up with him and said, Hey, dude, <laughs> make sure you give him the right address, because you know. But I swear, the kid like never leaves the house. He must be like gaming or something like nonstop, and every meal he gets comes in through like. <laughs> You know, it's like Pizza Hut, Jimmy John's, you know, it's like whoever delivers, he's ordering from them. But I'll tell you what, if you guys want a quick part-time job that makes a lot of money, not working a lot of hours, doing like Jimmy John's delivery. I had, I had one of my students, he would work the, like the graveyard shift on a Friday and Saturday. He told me he was making a couple hundred dollars a night in tips. I was like, man. Yep. Yep, and this is Eat Street. Yeah, there's, there's, and there's Eat Street and Grubhub. I'm trying to think of the other one. Even Uber, Uber delivers food. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think that's kind of like a weird. So a lot of a lot of businesses are kind of cashing in on that, and and where it really, 
I mean, not, not that it's not happening in Racine, but I see it like in our urban environment where you know, it's hard to park and take the car out and all that stuff. We're, I see a lot of it. And I think like the Uber drivers, mostly in like our side of town in Milwaukee, are delivering food more than they're, they're delivering people. <laughs> you know, but hey, it's a living, you know, it's a thing. Okay. Oh, like catering or something. Yeah, catering. Sure. Crazy. We do that when we have our meetings here, you know. It makes more sense to order from a place that can bring it to you. Yeah. Right? Nothing wrong with that. Even if there is a little bit of an extra charge, right? Because then you have to go to the hassle of making it, getting it, leaving the house, getting out of your pajamas. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, now, we talked about this before, different types of e-commerce, and, and I think we covered most of them. Uh, but I think the interesting one is, you know, since we do most of our surfing on our mobile devices, are you guys brave enough to order stuff on your phone or do you opt to go to a computer? Prefer the computer? And that used to kind of be my operating paradigm. I'm like, I could buy it on my phone. I, I think I'd just rather hop up on the computer and make sure. I always had that mindset. And lately I've been kind of letting that go a little bit. Where depending on the site, like if it's Amazon or eBay, I'm pretty trusting to do it on my phone now. But there's some websites where I don't feel quite as comfortable. So it's curious that, that you kind of have that mindset too. Sometimes I just feel more confident. It's like if I'm looking up like my bank account, I'd rather be on my computer than on my phone. I get paranoid on the phone that somebody's going to hack in or tap into my data stream. And you know, it's probably silly, but. Uh, and the other one that, that's kind of transitioning too, and it's been a, a long time coming, is a lot of government organizations now are going into the fray too. So where you normally would have to like go down to city hall to pay your property taxes. And it was always a pain because everybody does it at the same time, which is basically at the last minute, you know, because they're all waiting on payday or whatever, or saving up the money. Now you can get online and you can pay your parking tickets, yeah. you know, or look stuff up. So that, that's a growth area too. Um, all right. So... Right, we talked about some of these topics too, so I'm kind of like um, jumping over them. But I, I think it's kind of interesting. Um, you know, let's go, let's go to that auction thing. When eBay came out and they were an auction site, and that's all they were, right? Anything that you would put up for sale there had a timer on it, usually a few days or a week or whatever. And then you, you put in a starting price, and then people would bid. And it was always amazing to me that sometimes you could walk away kind of almost stealing something, you know, you know, even like brand new things and get them for a fraction of the price. Yeah, you can get some really nice stuff on eBay. I mean, as long as it's not too good. I mean, they're really yeah, right. too good to be true. Yeah, there are those. And then there was... Yeah, I would, I would concur with that because right now we're kind of at this point that all the people that did like the, kind of like the rush on buying all the thousand series cards, kind of, that kind of exhausted itself. So now the prices are coming down. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I, I concur with that. But I, what I always found fascinating with those auctions is there was like this etiquette that developed over time. And it wasn't at first. People would normally say, well, I'm just going to bid 50 bucks and see what happens. But then... There was this technique that, that arose, and we took advantage of it a couple of times. It's how I got my car. It's like stealth bidding. It's like, okay, 20 seconds to go. Now I'm going to bid because when I get my bid in, the other person can't counter. There's no time to counter bid. You're screwed. Right? Yeah, what do they call it? Like sniping. Yeah, I think it's sniping is the right word. But then eBay got wise. Then they were like, they put in this mechanism so that if you put in like a bid already and somebody is like doing that technique, then it automatically bids up to a certain amount for you. So, it was, so they kind of combated it. But then they really switched their paradigm where you could make offers on products. Right. 
you could buy it now at a set price. Um, or you could do the traditional auctions, but the auctions really are almost nothing now. But I do find it to be um, really a great way to get a lot of stuff really cheap. And sometimes significantly uh, cheaper than you can get uh, at other venues. So I always encourage you um, to do that. Now, this whole concept of online selling, or really the, the point of like selling remotely, isn't a new idea. It really started all with catalog sales. And do you know what the big catalog sale company was in the United States for a long time? Sears. Sears, right? Started right down in Chicago. Through Sears, they used to have this big printed catalog, and you could order the catalog, and it was usually free, just pay for the postage, right? And the old ones were really thick. And you know the kind of stuff you could order in there? Like, pretty much anything. It was kind of like Amazon, but printed. You could, you could buy kits to build a house. You could buy a car. You could buy guns. You could buy livestock. You could buy food. It was like crazy, right? And it just surprises me that their model kind of failed, that they never were able to take that whole concept and move it online. Because they really kind of came up with the idea in a lot of ways. J.C. Penney, too, big on, on the catalog thing. And then when you think of Amazon, I think of it now as like a big catalog site. Because you can kind of find anything on there. I'd say that eBay really is more of a, you can find anything, because I can buy a car and a house on eBay. I can't really do that on Amazon. At least not that I know. So, not <laughs> yeah, not yet. Um, lots of different ways to pay. Now, yeah, you can pay electronically via check. You can pay by credit cards, PayPal, all that kind of stuff. Does anybody use a digital wallet? Does anybody have like one of those things on their phone where they walk up and they scan their phone and? Like Samsung Pay or Apple Pay, or you do that? Yes. How do you like it? Yes, we need to pay to like, like, especially like sometimes I like to like, not my wallet at home, like, oh, and I'm right. Like, oh. And, and you know, so I've been thinking about doing it, but I always refrain because I know what technologies are out there too, right? You know that technology, right? And a lot of credit cards have it now. It's called NFC. We should have talked about it in networking, really which stands for near field communication. So that's where you take your device, touch it to another device, and it, they, they make a connection, you move the data, and that's basically what you're doing when you're walking up to a point of sale thing. You just hold your phone up, and they, they have like those Visa commercials. Hey, show me how that works. Hey, thanks for paying, <laughs> right? Um, but I'm a little paranoid of that one, honestly, I'm, because I know that people have scanners that are really strong that can tap into it at the same time. So it makes me a little paranoid. Yeah, see, that's why you use the secure, secure ones. It's almost the same concept as uh, uh, PayPal. Right. But it's a cash app. And I use that. Oh, for, like, okay. Yeah, yeah so like, like Squarespace or, mm -hmm. yeah, there's, there's a number of services like that. So like when, my daughter left her middle school. They were doing like a graduation thing at the end of the year. And they were, you know, everybody donate 10 bucks. And the person organizing it did it through an app. She, so she just sent a link and I had to download the app and send her money electronically instead of like giving her a $10 bill or a check or whatever. It's like the new way of the world. Yeah, the, the other thing is, is you, if you guys have ever seen this, like usually if you go to like a flea market or a garage sale or something, some people have those little card readers. They plug into the headphone jack and you can swipe your card. Or you can hand key in the card. And you know, I have that app on my phone, right? So I'm never in the situation where somebody's like, hey man, I don't have any cash with me, I'll pay you later. Like, I got your visa? <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> I, I, got, I got paid, you know? Right. <laughs> right, like like beggars, right? Yeah. They got a quarter, a yeah, dollar or something. Or something. It's like, no, I do. I take Visa. <laughs> right? There are people, in, and we don't see them around here, but if you go to New York City, there's people that are professional beggars. Seattle. And they make tons of money. They might make like 100 grand a year just sitting in the subway asking for money. 
I'm not recommending it as a career path, by the way, but I'm just, I'm just saying. Um, how a credit card works. Do you guys have any idea how a credit card works? <laughs> Gives you money away. Well, it's just a way to move money around. But every time you use a credit card, folks, it is not free. As a consumer, if you buy something for 50 bucks, on your statement will be a charge for 50 bucks. And then, of course, if it's a credit card, you don't pay your bill, interest accrues, right? But did you guys know that the people that accept the credit card have to pay fees on the cards? It, it'll range, you know, it's within a range, but typically the total cost to a merchant is somewhere between three and a half to five percent of the sale. That's why when you walk into some stores and they say, yeah. you gotta buy at least this much stuff before we can take your credit card. The other thing that happens is if it's a debit card, why do stores like Woodman's prefer to take a debit card? Because it comes directly from your bank account. You get charged more. In, they get the money immediately. It's bank to bank transfer. The fee that they pay is much smaller, especially on large ticket items. So with some credit cards, like if you got one that's got like airline miles or uh, car points or you know whatever the, the, the scam is, you know it's not a scam, it's the deal, right? Uh, or a rebate or something. Some merchants, just by swiping that card, whatever their percentage and their fee is, there's also like a $3 swipe charge because it's a platinum card. And I remember when I was a merchant and I would see that, I'm like, so a guy bought like a stick of gum and I paid three bucks for him to buy it. I want you to think about that, right? Guy walks in, platinum card, swipe the card, gets his airline miles. You just paid $3 towards him getting on a plane. And you cleared like 10 cents profit on a stick of gum. That's why when merchants post those signs, um, for a minimum, that's why they do it. The interesting thing is though, per the charter of MasterCard and Visa, they're not supposed to deny a sale of any amount. One penny is legally supposed to be accepted. But what they can do, and what I used to do, is if it was under a certain amount, and I wouldn't really do it all the time, just kind of to discourage that practice of people building airline miles basically, um, is you can charge them a fee. So if it's under five bucks, I'm charging you three bucks. Yeah, even for that penny piece of candy. Now you don't typically see that anywhere. Most merchants figure it, it'll balance out in the long run. But, that, but that, there's a lot of money that gets transacted. I, in some ways, in my very cynical self, I, I kind of view this whole operation with credit cards that it's like brilliant. Because we used to have this large seg segment of the economy where people would get paid and you used to go to the bank on Friday, cash your check, and put some money in the bank, and you take the rest out in cash. And then you go shopping, and everything's cash. Right? There's no percentages for the merchant, no percentages for the consumer. Then they switched this all to debit cards and credit cards, and how many of you even use cash? Like, yeah, I do too. Right? Like, you shouldn't go to the bar and pay with a credit card, folks. I'm just telling you. <laughs> Pay with cash, you know, bartenders like it. Uh, but, but seriously, now all those transactions, if you think about MasterCard and Visa, they're making like 1% to 2% on every transaction that happens. And not only that, but they're tracking you at the same time. Tony Soprano and the Mafia couldn't have come up with a better scheme. Yeah, you know, one or two points, you know. On every transaction. And they're building these giant glass towers and making these multimillionaires who are profiting off of your fear of using cash. And we're moving towards a cashless society. And I don't think it's necessarily bad, but all of a sudden, the underground economy is completely gone. And what, what, what's the underground economy? The babysitter who gets paid in cash. The kid that mows the lawn. Okay, the drug dealers too, but... <laughs> But seriously, there's drug dealers now that take <laughs> that take credit cards. What? Yeah. You know, I was watching that show on, on HBO, High Maintenance. You guys ever watch that one? All right, no, okay. Well, anyways, 
the guy, you know, and that's what they call him on the show, the guy that transacts, he all of a sudden was like, oh, okay, I'll take electronic money. He kind of like succumbed to it. He's like, eh, I guess I guess they could track it, but they really don't know what it's for. Maybe when it's medicine. Okay, Services rendered. Mm -hmm. Who's to say? But that's weird, isn't it? So there's there's an advantage, and one, the other advantage of actually paying cash, folks, is you can walk into places, and because if a merchant knows that you're paying in cash. And if you bought that $1,000 laptop with cash, and it's costing them 3 to 5%, that's 50 bucks. And you can just walk in and say, hey, cut $100 off the price if I pay cash. You'd be surprised. Sometimes they'll say yes. Because they know what the numbers add up to. So there's still a place for it. But credit cards are kind of scary. Um, a purchasing card. You guys ever have a purchasing card? It's like a gift card. You ever get like a like an Amazon card or a Steam card, right? That's like my son's thing. He doesn't have a credit card or a bank account, so he wants to buy games on Steam. I used to do it for him. I'm like, no. You got to walk up to Walgreens and buy a Steam card, kid. You got to earn it somehow, you know. And I prefer that because then he actually sees the value of it. The other one that you see there, the Metro card. Okay, we don't have that around here, but if you go to like New York City or any big city that's got big public transportation, subway systems, bus systems, a lot of times you get these cards that you can recharge. Um, you know, I know the buses around here work differently, but those are different forms of electronic payment. Um, smart cards. James, that's what you were just saying. And what's a smart card? And you're seeing this on all the credit cards now, is you're seeing the chip, yeah. right? And all of our newer cards, like whenever you get a new card from your bank, like a debit card or credit card, what's happening now, you have that chip, so instead of swiping, you're inserting. Why? What's the advantage there? It's yeah, the, the data is encrypted, supposedly safely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, catch the keyword, supposedly. All right. All right, I'm just trying to see what other um, types of things that we want to talk about here. A um, lot of different um, things happen because of IT. And I think we talked about this early on. When we were younger, right, and I talk about my, the old bank accounts that we used to have, and we used to get passbooks, right? And you know what a passbook was? It was just a piece of paper. They put it in a typewriter and they would type your bank balance on your passbook. And then when you went in to get your money out, they would look at your passbook and go, all right, you got 50 bucks, they can take 50 bucks out. And of course, they had an electronic record, but nobody had mobile phones, nobody had computers back then. Then they came out with the ATM, right? And I told you about this revolution. It was a revolution in banking, because all of a sudden, you know, it used to be you had to plan ahead to go out drinking, you know, take you know, 20 bucks out on a Friday night. And then all of a sudden, it's like, Heck, there's an ATM in the bar. I can get some more cash. Let's party. And then all of a sudden, we have online banking and mobile banking. Do you guys feel comfortable with that? You guys don't know it a different way. In fact, there's so many conveniences. Like with banking online, what can you do? You can just hop in there, see if you got paid, see if your bills went through, right? See how much money you got right now before you, you, know, you walk in and your card declines, right? So, some advantages there. Did you guys read that case study? All right, advertising, uh, not too much to talk about there. We talked about how this is the biggest segment of e-commerce that we really don't think about. Way more sales business to business. And I'm trying to see if there's anything else here. Yeah, we talked about these, I suppose. All right. What I'd like to do now is last time, you know, we tried this Raspberry Pi thing and it was a, a miserable failure. You know what the problem was, folks? The little SD card that I had was corrupted somehow. And that's why it was taking so long to write. Um, and so, I, of course, I have a spare because I'm an IT guy. <laughs> that's how it goes. 
right? I was, I was Carrie Spares. And so I did finally get it downloaded and installed. So I want to demonstrate the Raspberry Pi to you. Sound like a plan? All right. So this is going to take me a couple of minutes to hook up if you guys need to step up, walk about a little bit. And then what I'd like to do is instead of me operating it, I'd like to kind of get a volunteer. 